Hello, hello, and welcome hello. again. Spill the data. I'm Tim Diego. And I'm Sadani Daly. And today, as promised last week, we've got the Sadani Daly show. She's going to tell you all about one of her projects that uh, she did at Lambda School. And we're going to try a different format, maybe a little shorter this week. We'll see. Yeah. And Timothy's going to be my trusted assistant. <laughs> so if things are going a little wayward, he'll jump in. <laughs> All right, so um, this is my first project I did at Lambda, and we had to basically pull a data set. So here I imported lots of libraries. I have a math library, I have like plotting libraries, I have pandas, which like should, helps you with the uh, code in Python. I got statistic libraries. A lot of plot, uh, graphing libraries because I wanted to make some cool graphs. So those are all the libraries I imported. Really Here. quick, really quick. Pandas, yeah. I didn't know this the whole time I was using it. I just thought it was named after the animal or something, but it actually stands for, stands for uh, panel data. So oh, that's wow. the library for, you know, making it look, making this the comma separated values, the CSV files. Um, into nice little panels like she has down here. Like, oh, yes. wow. Okay. And I thought the whole time was just like to help you are coding in Python. So I'm sure it had some value there, right? No? Yeah, no, it definitely does. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it makes um, the pandas functions make easy, it easier to deal with um, with data frames. So, you know, you can do a lot of things in pandas um, that you wouldn't be able to do with just a text file. So it actually formats your file. It puts all the category or the um, column names up top, nice and neat, you know, gives you an index for all each row and allows you to, you know, call in um, or access different parts of, of the file instead of it just being a big blob of text that you'd have to somehow otherwise search through. And this is why Timothy is my trusted assistant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I pulled my data set from data.ny.gov, which is like an amazing site. You can go there if you like a New York or just anything about New York, you can go there and pull so much data about the entire uh, state of New York. And then you could also um, scale it down to just be New York City, which is kind of like what I did here. So I pulled out this data set, which is about like crime in New York state. And when I pull it up, like it covers an entire New York state. So I have like Albany here, um, Albany County, just, you know, all these other counties. And it says like over here, I have like non-New York counties, but then this is 20,596 rows. So here you only see uh, what five rows, but it's a pretty big data set. And here I um, pull the county values. So you got to see there's 63 different counties in um, the state of New York or how this was broken down. Uh, so I went ahead and there's this thing called ISNAL where you remove any values that basically have no purpose. Um, and so by scaling those values out, I was able to have a more a cleaner data set. So that's considered like cleaning the data pretty much. Um, and then once I clean the data, I checked it again to make sure it was definitely clean. Uh, and then here I dropped some data frames, some data frames that I really didn't need. Like I didn't need agency, region, months reported, index total, because I just really wanted to see the crimes committed um, in New York City particularly. And that was like my target focus. So here I scale it down to us have like the year and the amount of the total amount of crime and then breaks down into the types of crimes. So it's like murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, et cetera. Um, and then over here, I grouped it by county and year because I want it to be in order. I wanted to start from 1990, which was the latest year they had the data from all the way up to I believe 2015. And then I got rid of all the counties that were not um, related to like New York city itself. So this is me like getting rid of all these counties. And now I have all I have are Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, Bronx, Long Island left. So this is me just cleaning up the data 
to get it exactly what I want it to be. And this is, yeah, this is just like taking out that data. And here is the final data frame that I want to have. And it has only NYC, the year is commit, uh, the crime was committed and then the types of crime committed. And here I threw that data on a seaborne bar graph just to get an idea, but as you can see, it's not like the best way to display this data. And so that's where you go and you start looking at other ways to graph it. And this is just me, just, just all just clean the data. I was like wanting to see by year. It's just like me playing around just to get a sense of what happened when. The yeah. great thing about this is that you get so curious about things. Like this is just me strictly just being curious. Like I want to know what happened in Staten Island. 100%. And so I did a Staten Island index year to see this. Yeah. Exploratory data analysis is not only for work. <laughs> sometimes, it's, it's not. <laughs> sometimes you really just want to know something. You're like, wow, I got all this data at my fingertips now. I, I want to look at, you know, my home city, my hometown, my home county. Exactly. Can I say that one of the things I'm most impressed with right now is that you code with those cute little kittens crawling across the top of your screen. I would be so distracted at all times. Really? I thought they were so like <laughs> zen-like, like, ah, okay. I'm going to do this coding for the next 10 hours, but I have kittens. That's so okay. <laughs> I keep so the like, oh, Siamese. Oh, uh. <laughs> but go ahead. So um, here is that same graph that we saw earlier. Um, and it looks 10 times better in this way. I think this was um, Chart Studio, yeah. So I installed Chart Studio and look at this. It's so beautiful, so colorful. And each one tells us this is the Bronx, Long Island. So why Long Island was like really going on with some stuff in 2002. <laughs> Oh, let me move us because that's sitting on top of the key. So yeah, the key over here is the colors for right. Mm -hmm. Yep, each um, go. each of the this boroughs. Like yeah, those are the boroughs, and I threw Long Island in there because even though Long Island's not considered a borough, I feel like it's we can't leave the Long Island out. I grew up in Long Island; it needs to be included. And that's how <laughs> I feel about it. <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough. Fair enough, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, so even here, I say like create graphs to visualize the rate of various crimes in the fire boroughs of New York City plus Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here, I scale it down to 2002, 2007, because I wanted to have like a smaller frame, um, just to have like a, a comparison within the, the years a little closer to each other. And basically it shows like a general decrease in violent crime. Bronx does have a little bit of up and down here and so does Brooklyn. Um, but for the most part, crime has been decreasing in New York City. And, oh yeah, this, yeah, here it is also. Yeah, another thing I'm impressed with, I didn't realize because your project doesn't show a lot of the visualizations that you tried, um, that you'd done so many others. So we'll have to yeah. take a look at the article too, because yeah, that's-, that's Right, nice. yeah. So, um, you know, like for the project, the only one is to use a certain amount of graphs, but I, mm -hmm. because I was so curious and I thought it was such an uh, interesting topic, I did like a bunch of graphs. So it's like violent total. This is like murder rate. Um, yeah. So I broke it down this is like the rape. So I really like went all in. So I was like, this is kind of fascinating. And it's like right there at our fingertips. You never think about it. But literally, like you can find all this data. It's like public. It's like available. It's just for you to like have the interest and go look for it. Properties What's that one? decline. Okay. This is property total. So down. This has been like pretty <laughs> consistently down. <laughs> okay. So the property total is that property yeah. value? Yeah, like um, any crimes against property, basically oh, like vandalism and okay. anything like that. That's been down. Man, and so the artists get on, gotta get on their work. They're, they're fit with all <laughs> <laughs> been down, motor vehicle theft. So for the most part, you know, crime in New York is decreasing. Mm -hmm. I, but unfortunately, like some of the more like um, serious crimes have kind of have like a little uh, oscillating effect, like the with the rate is like down yeah. and up and down. Yeah, like rate is like, okay. has been yeah, actually climbing yeah, in the past. Those are kind years. of sideways or up 
trending yeah. like when we consider like in i guess in the terms of financial markets if something goes up and down like that and it kind of ends near the same place where it started it's not really considered an up or down trend it's just sideways yeah so um so there have been some dips but it seems like as you know yeah the more the more serious um crime it seems yeah you know, Staten Island, we're working on it. Looks like it's doing all right on every single one of them. Looks like I know where yeah, I'm not too I'm bad. <laughs> so, okay, so I wanted to look at crimes in New York City, and then I wanted to look at citizens' complaints against the New York uh, Police Department. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do this is because at the time that we had the project was in the summer when we were having all the, you know, the protests about Black Lives Matter and the unfortunate um, murder of George Floyd. So I wanted to see how does the um, NYPD measure up on the national scheme of things. Sure. So here again, pulling the data. The data for this wasn't as clean, which was unfortunate. So um, or has or as comprehensive. And I think we talked about this before about how sometimes things are not reported accurately, or the way it's reported doesn't really fit into the data frame. Or, you know, there's just uh, lots of human error yeah, the, the, that occurs. And so sometimes things may not be as representational as the actual truth. Yeah, so this is basically times, me just going through and cleaning up the data. A lot of times we get data and, or I've, I've seen data sets, you know, when you're in a, comp oh, that's pretty. When you get into a casual competition data sets, like there's, everything's all nice and neat and it, someone's already done all the cleaning work, but then you open one up that's like from a government site and there's a whole bunch of NAN values, which means not a number um, of which means they didn't enter anything basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't want to, I don't want to take it away from you. That looks like a really, really cool looking graph. Go ahead. I know. I like <laughs> love, uh, yeah, studio is pretty cool. So this is the sense of complaints against NYPD. And so we see there was like a sh rise all across the boroughs. Um, and even a bit in Long Island. And then right around here, which is like what, 2009, we started to see a bit of a decline. And that was like across the boroughs in that time. And that interactive plot, um, is that Plotly Studio? Yeah, okay. yeah. Cool, right? Yeah, really cool. I love it. Yeah. I had too much fun with this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like plotting things I should be plotting. I was like, I just wanted to see how it looks. <laughs> And then I wanted to like uh, cross correlate the two. So this is citizen complaints um, and this is the total number of crimes. Can we talk, I know it's been a little yeah. while, but can you talk a little bit about how, what, like what I'm looking at there? If I'm, if I'm a person that has no idea what this graph is, cause I- Yeah, am. sure. So this is the citizen's <laughs> complaint of, against NYC. This is the bottom part, the blue down here. And then, okay. um, you could kind of see where like it, it mirrors the graph I showed earlier where like it was, it went up, right? Across the bars and it started to go down. And okay. that's basically what this is mirroring here. So that's and an then, average or not an average, but each one of those um, yeah. lines that you see in the blue bars is one of the different boroughs. Right. Like separation, okay. Mm -hmm. And then the total crimes. Um, and then the total crimes is here, the red bar. So here you see how it was like really high and then it went, had a little dip and went back up again. Okay. And it's dipping yep. and overall it's dipping, but we do have some outliers that we talked about oh, earlier. Oh, so the, there's yeah. the crimes in the red line yeah. and then the actual complaints are in the blue. against mm -hmm. the police yeah. um, is the blue. And you can kind of see how like, um, it's almost like the same, the same kind of graph. How like, I mean, here was a little outlier when there was high as far as crimes. And then yeah, as higher and lower there and then it's yeah, and it lower like, and higher in 2007 right you know where it's still a little higher so it kind of has like the same flow yeah the only thing and i hate to hate to like dig at you about this but what are no the worries. diagonal lines how do you how do you interpret this here this is the, the 10k 20k no the the diagonal like the lines between the two cities like between the two times that it's like up a little bit uh -huh. in between that, that, that. oh that's just um that's the style of the graph that's how to connect the yeah it doesn't have any kind of data on it it literally just okay. like 
in plot latest was like this cool way they made this graph where they it shows like the these things are actually connected but there's like no data on it it's just like points like this is a point and it goes to this other point and it's just points okay you see yeah yeah i got you all right <laughs> All right, so that is pretty much that. And then I go through some other things down here, like I'm looking at con confidence um, intervals, just to see if like my data um, really aligned or like my thesis uh, aligned. And I, that's pretty much saying that it does. So what was my takeaway? So I wrote this article on Medium and it says, when doing the right thing trumps the data. And I kind of just give like a little bit of preview about what's going on in the country. And I asked the question, has crime decreased in New York City while citizen complaints against the New York PD has risen? And actually, no, okay? Mm -hmm. Citizens complaint in New York City has not risen. And so it was not going along with the trend about what's happening in the country. Um, as a matter of fact, NYPD was, um, charting pretty well in New York City as far as like people's faith in the NYPD. Um, but there was a reason for that. When Mayor de Blasio came into power, he, in, uh, he institutionalized a lot of policies such as, such as he stopped the frisk, um, the stop and frisk policy was unconstitutional, became unconstitutional in New York City. Okay. Um, he also had policies where he um, made the NYPD more, um, I guess, citizens friendly. He want he like had these um, policies in place where the NYPD had like outreach programs to really connect with the citizens of New York, and so that those kind of like social policies actually helped with the decline of citizens complaint. And it probably also correlates with the total decrease in crime because people's trust in NYPD um, increased. And so hmm. they were more cooperative with the NYPD. More cooperative, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's good, good possibility. Um, I'm not gonna throw any conspiracies out there, but there's also the possibility that, <laughs> you know, who, where, where are the reports going? You know, like when you make right. a, you make a report against the police, it's gotta go to some law enforcement agency. Are all reports getting logged into the data? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the only tough part. I mean, I'm not, you know, again, I'm- I, No, I, I totally only, agree. Even when look. I was um, looking for my data, I originally looked for the data um, from the police uh, website and, the data was a such it was such a disarray. It was hard to like even like pull it. It was hard to like clean it up, and so I had to go on our website to get the full data. And you know that was incomprehensive. So and that only started from a period of time, two thousand two, I think. Um, so it was first of all, it wasn't complete. It wasn't clean, and it wasn't. Um, it didn't have many years of data. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there are definitely like some valid concerns or theories there, I'm sure. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I, I know that you did a good job um, data storytelling. You didn't really leave it up long enough for any, everyone to read, but I will uh, post the link to that in the description um, of the podcast. And um, since we have at least another 13 minutes, I'm going to run through, <laughs> run through my, uh, second project quickly my second article i should say um and i actually just was putting together my resume so i happen to have it up somewhere let me find it before i uh share my screen how how is that how is the resume um building going like um, have you had like input from the career developers i have had amazing input from the career developers. I, I sent them my other re resume, they sent me back. They're like, that's, you know, pretty good. And you can use some of that stuff, but do this, like basically revamp it. Here's a template, you know, you can base it off of, here's another, you know, good one you can start with. And I was able to, you know, read, just swap some things around, change my formatting or change formatting to the formatting I liked. Um, but the, but things were already all in place. So, and then um, I submitted that back and immediately the next day she gave me, you know, made some suggestions for edits. 
Um, so yeah, it's really, really, um, it's almost the best thing so far, as far as my Lambda experience has gone. Not to make Lambda, you know, not to be bad, but it's, it's I cannot speak anything negative about the careers um, people. Like they're there um, and quick, you know, and they're actually interested and, and, and focused. They're giving like full feedback on, um, you know, to the, to the, to the very, the, for the most detail I could, I can imagine. Um, boom. So I'm going to share my screen as soon as I scroll this thing up out of the way. Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to do it the opposite of the format Donnie just used. Oh. <laughs> while, we're here, while you're doing that, could we talk about like how awesome Google, um, Google Colab is? Because sure. now I'm working in VS Code and I'm like, <laughs> I want Google Colab back. Like, I just want to code only in Google Colab. Like, you know, we could probably talk for the next 10 minutes just about that. So I'll, I'll hold off on my second project. Um, Everybody you raise about VS there, Code and I'm just like, I don't get it. See, Why thing, we okay. like this so much. Here's the thing. Colab Jupyter Notebooks, they're cool when you're just doing data exploration, when you'd like, you know, when you want to test each each little line of code, each little block at a time. Um, but when you go to create an application that you want to want to live online somewhere, or when you go to make production level code in Python, you mm -hmm. have to have like a, a set of your own files. And you'll start doing things like um call like you have a file with uh, a classes or functions in it that you've defined and then you can import from your own file right you can import things um mm -hmm. you can also import from your built-in libraries um but the but but can't you also do that on google collab you can totally import local stuff on google collab yeah but then you can't you can't necessarily um post you can't use google collab to make a web app that will last Okay, because um, then it would have to, yeah, it'd have to access your code some kind of way to run it. Um, you know, when you, once you start learning a little bit more about, um, I, well, I don't even know if you're going to get into Docker containers and all um, mm -hmm. as you move into web, but um, as you as, as the data scientists start learning about how to make production level code, which means like the actual type of code we'll be building for um, an application for a company. Um, you'll do all your data exploration, your data cleaning and things like that in, in a notebook, whether it's Colab, Jupyter Notebooks locally, um, right. or I don't know, I guess even and even Kaggle has its own notebooks. I just found that out, but, um, oh, but yeah, cool. you can use those things for, you know, the, the temporary tasks, the things like, okay, I just wanna, you know, I wanna do some exploration. I wanna make some visualizations, uh, you know, um, right. um, and then import them from co my Colab into whatever. but. When you want to make an app that somebody can use um, that has a model already in it, um, that has other files that it's going to have to call on in a package that's right. all put into one container. And the reason why containers are important, um, like Docker um, or uh, Cybernetis, I think is the other name. I, I Don't quote me on that. I know it's something along those lines. Um, you get this down, sir. You're going for an interview soon, okay? Yeah, it's coming up, this but, out. Well, I've never used um, Cybernetis. I, and I and I don't, I don't, I, I've only, you know, I've heard of it, but once you know Docker, you know, um, the rest of it's just like, it translates well. It's just like a, right. like, like Amazon Web Services has their own version of Docker, but it's called something right. else. Yeah. So they're just names, you know, it's just different companies. It's like, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, or, Amazon completely just crucify that, right? Like coming up with their own, like AWS. Like that they, was they have the monopoly. They pretty much right? are the cloud. Like everybody else, just like <laughs> Amazon. So trying to catch up. <laughs> Amazon, yes. Amazon, I've heard of all the other cloud services, Google, Microsoft, all of them together. Amazon is six times larger than all others combined wow. so combine them all and then multiply that by six and that's amazon's cloud that's service. and i didn't know that you know i, I thought amazon was just books <laughs> <I'm> just <kidding. laughs> no i knew they've come a long way since books but still like they're they yeah. are growing 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 that company and i mean Absolutely. it's not they just, definitely it's not yeah, just the website and getting 
and getting, you know, stuff quick to your house or just prime video or just, you know, I could say, or just about 12 more times, but, but but they do a lot of stuff behind the scenes too, that nobody realizes unless you And let me tell you, Amazon, like there are some manipulated techniques there because I promise you, I will prefer to buy something at Amazon because it has free shipping and it may cost more than a different website, but I'm like, but I get free shipping. Like, like well, why would I not buy it here? Shipping and it'll be here in two days. It's like buying stuff at 7-Eleven because it's super convenient, even though, you know, if you just went to the grocery store, it'd be like, <laughs> like, almost right, I'm price. Just like... like, but it's here and it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> no. So um, it, it is that convenience. And I mean, now that I have prime, it's even worse because everything's free and, and in a few days. And now I'm like, okay, now I'm just don't like, I don't, I don't even want to go to the store anymore. It's like, oh, I need something. Let me just look and see if they have it on prime. That's my first go-to. Oh my God. So yeah. they're going to have, they're, I'm just here, have my money, all of my money. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. They get like, cool you will stuff never see me like, step foot in a department store yeah. ever again. I'm just like, why would I do that? The and you know, what's the cool thing about Amazon too. Like, as you think of it, you can just be like, oh, I think I need a rolling pin. <laughs> see Amazon has it, you know? <laughs> right. right. Or sometimes if you haven't thought of it, they'll suggest it to you. Right. The only gripe I have about that is I sometimes will have bought something and then they're still suggesting it to me. Like, come on. Oh, <laughs> like, got it, dude. Don't you something know? new. Like, you know, my ad, my ad, like that should probably go into my, you know, suggestion, like algorithm is per things I've already purchased. Like I don't need two grocery carts <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, but anyway, Amazon does, Amazon's doing yeah. great things. Um, I see yeah. why their stock price goes uh, and it's been up and down, but lately, right. but I see, yeah. see why they're on the steady climb. Like they're coming out with grocery stores. Did you know about that? Like, well, they partnered with Whole Foods and they do something apart from that. Um, yeah, there's going to be, well, maybe they, okay, they partnered with Whole Foods with the cart or with delivery? Delivery too. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. definitely have Amazon Fresh through Whole Foods, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but yeah, there's something apart from that where you can, it's just Amazon grocery mm-hmm. store and you go in and there's no cashiers. Like as you put stuff into your cart, it knows what you put in the cart and it just comes out of your you don't ever like pay brick for and mortar mortar stores yeah or like, like actual oh. brick and mortar stores and then you just and then there's even like a little weight thing like for the fruits or whatever that that you can you place it on a thing and type in what it is on the thing and it, so it knows mean, like, everything you have then you walk right out the door with it and so you know the stealing is going to be cut down there's gonna be no stealing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because you won't be able. I don't know how they're gonna. They're gonna. I guess the employees that they'll need there are security mainly, and if especially if right? it's. I don't want to say if especially. Nobody will accidentally forget to scan something. In an inner city, well, it's going once it goes in the cart. There's like wait, it doesn't. It's not. It's not like a beep thing. Right. It's like everything in there's got like an RFID, so it knows just from proximity what you're carrying with you. So, I mean, they're going to be, they're going to be beta testing it in some places. Who knows if it's actually going to work right. well and work in, you know, probably more likely to be in um, the suburbs than the inner cities. Cause... Hey, don't want to estimate people from the suburbs, okay? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm from the suburbs, uh, you know, originally from the suburbs. I'm just saying I've lived in the suburbs and I've lived in inner city and I don't know how that's going to work out in, in the inner city Baltimore. Some guy's going to have that cart hacked in a week. Right, <laughs> some kind of way. It's not going to be fancy computer <laughs> hacked either. It's going to be like they did with the lime scooters and just ride <laughs> around. But um, yeah. So uh, Amazon, Amazon, uh, Amazon. We'll mm-hmm. just leave it at that. But we did get a little sidetrack. <laughs> talking about VS Code, and I think VS sure. Code doesn't like me. Like I cannot, for some reason, whenever I try to go live, it sends me to some a local host. I'm just like, why is this app tormenting me? <laughs> Because and you're the only thing, it. the reason why you probably don't like VS Code is the first exposure you have to it is um, trying to deploy a web app through Heroku and all of that stuff. So like VS Code, just as a general rule, is a great thing for just, you know, not having to be online. Um, you know, you don't have to be on, well, not that ever, you're ever probably not connected online, but that's, you know, you can't use Colab if you're not online, but if you have Python um, connected locally, you can create your own what's called virtual environment. And then you have all of your libraries that are just installed in that virtual environment. And then at the end, you can pack all the stuff up that you built, including all the dependencies that you have. 
and put it in something called a Docker container. And then now that container is down to the, the bit level. So it doesn't matter if you're on a iOS machine, a Windows machine or a Linux machine or whatever else may come up, if anything, machine. Um, <laughs> you can then take that and your computer will know how to translate everything. So it'll work before, it'll work no matter who's looking at it. And, yeah. and I mean, they, they may have eventually come up with um, ways to do that in the cloud. Um, I'm sure Colab's probably already working on something along, <laughs> or Google, yeah. I should say. Colab needs to just like come in and just eviscerate VS Code and make my life easy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but VS um, Code has its competition too. VS Code is Microsoft. Um, and then there, if you don't like VS Code, there is, um, there are others. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of them and I should probably know their names by heart, but um, yeah, there's PyCharm. You know, yeah. there's Adam, there's a bunch of other IDEs, um, yeah. which is an independent development environment or something development environment, um, you know, where you can do your own development of applications. Um, and, it, and they work, the, the cool thing about that is they work for not just Python. VS Code will work in every language. That's true. Yeah, that is true. You know? and, I, and, um, and I don't know about Colab, it might. You know, it might have to set up different environments. Okay. We've only ever used it with Python, so. Right. Um, um, as we were talking about Amazon, I also talked like all about GitHub, because I literally push everything from VS Code to GitHub, and I was thinking, what happens if GitHub collapses? Because everybody pushes their stuff to GitHub, and they collaborate and makes you know build things. Yeah, GitHub. Sorry, GitHub. I'm like, GitHub can never go away. And it can't. People have so much stuff stored in GitHub and like data frames that I've used for projects are stored there. So I, they can, no matter where it, they're being accessed, they can, you know, through a GitHub link. But GitHub is a, was an open source thing. Um, and it was produced by a lot of, a lot of coders that have not only coded there, but have helped to code other of their own programming languages and things like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that that the GitHub yeah the repositories are persisted somewhere like are backed up on some other servers besides you know just one i would imagine that something that intense that's holding so many people's like valuables is is probably strongly backed up and you know even all and that is the cool thing about github that is like open source and i feel like coders are kind of like taking over not taking over but more like taking a bit ownership of the game like they're not just relying on these big companies yeah kind of like you know regulate stuff they're like we're gonna do open source we're gonna like that's where all that you like um cryptocurrency stuff come in too right like your theorem and all those guys yeah a lot of it starts off that way um or they start off as just a you know they don't start off as a business cop model right and the business i mean that does, that's not to say that the people that created it don't stand to make anything from it because whoever created bitcoin gave himself a million Bitcoin to begin with. So if that person or people are, you know, still around and still are holding that value, then they have whatever the equivalent of 60,000 times a million is. Cause I, that's, that's way too far, way more money than what we think the richest man in the world has, but we don't know who that is. Um, right. Satoshi, Yakimoto, Satoshi, I, mean, I think it's Yakimoto. I don't want to, but Satoshi, we don't know who Satoshi is or, the group that is Satoshi. Um, there's there's lots of theories and all that stirring up, but but yeah, and that's um that's all done with you know hashing hash like very complicated hash tables and um, some of the things that you'll no matter which um, track you you join in, in 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 Lambda school you will get into the computer science that goes into hashing and and how. How you won't get into how blockchain works anymore. They used to have a whole segment on blockchain. Oh, really? That's yeah, cool. Yeah, I found that out. Um, but it's a uh, it's a less popular skill to have, and it's more it's more people that are really involved and want to try to create their own. That you know, it's up to them to learn it. Um, I, I I haven't really del delved into it. I mean, I have a good understanding about how it works, but I have. Um, only because I've done some research into saying like, why is Bitcoin so strong? Like why, why do people, uh, why is it worth so much? Why are so many people putting, there's a trillion dollars in it right now, like right. worldwide. There's that, if there's that much value stored in this 
cryptocurrency, it's going to open up a lot of people's eyes and, and say, wait, why? What? What is this? I thought it was just computer stuff, you know? And right. like, well, the truth is most of the American dollars is just computer stuff also, you know, but it's all in a centralized bank and banks are somewhat flawed. Um, you know, I, I'll just, I'll just, without, without incriminating anybody, I've met a guy that used to get a little less than 10,000. So it didn't, you know, send any red flags um, from banks just by hacking in, creating a fake account with a name that he knew, giving that name to, in a, you know, making a fake ID for somebody with that same name and having them go in and withdraw the money. And you can't do that with Bitcoin um, because the ledger exists and it doesn't exist on some bank's data frame. It exists in every person that mines Bitcoin's computer as well. So that would have to be changed with every single miner's ledger in order for a transaction to be flubbed or faked in Bitcoin. I don't know if you know this, but I know like they say you can only mine so much Bitcoin. Have they maxed out that amount yet? Are they still- no, no, they no. have. Um, I, 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 I see. When it comes so to these facts, I don't want to. I don't want to quote facts incorrectly, but I know for a fact that they have not. Um, you know, there is still mining to be to be had. Um, I don't know though how valuable or how good an idea it is to get into the mining game now, though, just because um, as more as less and less Bitcoin is available, um, less goes to the miners because it gets separated between you know, the amount of people that are mining okay, it, okay. or it's less likely, you should, I should say, that you will be the one that solves that block. And if your computer solves that block, then you get a little, you know, or part of it, the proof of work happens and you get some free Bitcoin for, um, and that's how new Bitcoin is produced. Right. But Bitcoin does have a cap. Um, there's only going to be a, a certain million, a certain amount of Bitcoin mined, and then it will shut off. And that means you know, as time goes on, there gets less and less of a supply and the demand goes up, but so, you know, that's what we're looking at. I, so this is my thing though, because Bitcoin originally was supposed to be like, you know, like against the banks, kind of like a FU against the banks, um, supposed to be like for the common man. Yeah. But if there's only a certain amount and it's already being hoarded, how does that really help the lower rung people? Um, well, it doesn't. <laughs> it's the short answer. Um, it's more. It's more now an investment, less than it is a currency. It's not being used as a transaction, currency so much because the right. value is so um, sporadic still. Right. Now, once it settles down, and you know all of Bitcoin is mined, and the final value of Bitcoin is established, um, it it might then you know then it will be a lot more people selling and buying it. Um, and as, as a value, you know, as a way to make money, because that's what it right. is now. It's like people would have put, let's say, um, June of last year, Bitcoin was around four thousand dollars a coin. It went really low right. after hitting twenty some k. You know, it and went down to four thousand, which is right. like twenty percent of what it was. So if you got in at the wrong time, you just lost, you know, four four fifths of your money. And then four thousand has now jumped up to about sixty thousand. So, right. but but, but my thing is this. Yes. If Bitcoin was supposed to be like this new currency, but yet we're still valued based on the U.S. dollar, and if you sell one Bitcoin, it's still equivalent to a U.S. dollar amount, right? right? So how is it really trying to obliterate the common currency if it's all based, its value is based on the common U.S. dollar? Um, See, Bitcoin itself doesn't really have any, like any intention like it, it could have been used for several different things it started off and it became popular unfortunately because it was being used for as a way to transact um anonymously because people were not attached to their bitcoin wallets by any sort of you know identifying thing you didn't have to give your whole you didn't have to sign your identity to it and then therefore it could not be taxed um, you could use it for, you know, most popularly in the past, it was used on Silk Road, which is no longer around. Right. Um, but people were using it for all kinds of things. But that was the only way to transact on Silk Road. So that's where it got it, its first boost. And then even after all that got shut down, um, and then people found out later on that, you know, actual Silk Road was a, was a lot less, it was a lot less useful there. I will say this, there are countries, though, whose currency is less stable than Bitcoin. 
Right. You know, in the U.S., it's based on the dollar when you cash out. But in Nigeria, it's not based on the U.S. dollar when you cashed out. You know, so like if your banks, you know, you take the money, you have, you make money, and you tr- and you turn it into Bitcoin, um, your money might actually dip, double, triple up, or it might just stay the same. But either way, it's not just going to vanish like it might in some of these countries where the the national currency is so low valued that right. you know you're at risk at any time of a complete economic collapse. Um, so worldwide, Bitcoin has different meaning than it does, um, you know, as in the USA. But then you've got a lot of like, you've got venture capitalists, you've got people that have made a lot of money in different ways that are just using it as a value store. They're dumping a bunch of money into it. They're popularizing it amongst the masses. Everybody's getting in and then it's a certain level and boom, they pull all their money out and it starts falling off a cliff and nobody knows why. And they're like, I thought Bitcoin was the way of the future. And you know, then it's down to like, like, so Bitcoin has a, has a, has a good, there's a, there's, yeah, there's a lot to be said about it, but right. um, as time goes on, you know, Bitcoin could see um, numbers up into the $200,000 a coin range before it's all right. said and done. Um, that's, I think the highest value that they think, you know, the possibility, the possibility of it happening. Um, but that's still only about four times what it's at, less than four times what it's at. Right. So I, I'm, I'm a lot happier putting my money into investments like stocks, like uh, Tesla did really well over the past year. You know, uh, Bitcoin has been up and down and all around. You got to you got to be ready. You got to be like, all right, I'm getting in now and watch it every day. And be like, OK, it's up, it's up. You it's know, it's so volatile things, you know, and volatile is the word. It's yeah. super volatile. And I feel like if people can come together collectively and, um, you know, alter the value of it, then. Right. Is it really serving the purpose it was meant for? I don't know. If they can game stock it. <laughs> that's right? going to become a verb, you know, just like they have with Doge. Now, Dogecoin, <laughs> while we're on the topic of cryptocurrencies, is the exact opposite end of the spectrum. Dogecoin is made to be inflationary. It's made to always be let at a low value. Every single time somebody uh, mines or like helps to mine Dogecoin, 10,000 new Dogecoins are produced. <laughs> and given out to people that mind it. So um, in a way it seems to be great because like it's always gonna be a low value, but people think they're, they're buying in for less than five cents for Dogecoin and they're putting all this money into it and they think it's gonna be the next Bitcoin and turn to $40,000 someday it is definitely not because <laughs> every time somebody sends a penny of worth of Doge, they could send one Dogecoin to somebody which is worth like, I don't know, um, it's worth like maybe, uh, I don't know, 0.05 cents right now or something. Okay. <laughs> might be points. To, it might be, it might be five cents. I, I'd have to bring up some charts. I actually have that. We'll do that one day. I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in a buddy of mine too. We're going to talk Forex. We're going to talk stock. Oh, I want to hear this. Yeah. yeah have you gonna... looked at um, NFTs? I, <laughs> yes. I only laugh because my gosh it's making me want to buy ethereum and not just meaning putting my own money into ethereum so i can buy nfts but actually invest in ethereum because a lot of people are looking at nfts now and they're like i want to get in this looks like fun my you daughter know? made one <laughs> did she make one i need to learn how to make one i need to she made like to daughter. art and she posted it nobody's bought it yet <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's hard. It's probably a hard, and, and if you don't have, um, you know, some sort of following and a way to get people interested in it, yeah. I have digital art that I'd love to put out, you know, I'd love to. Um, put it on there, man. Because I, I, it's just digital art. And I've always been like, yeah, it's free. It's whatever. It's digital anyway, you know, and that's how people are. But like, but when you can say I own the original, yeah. it doesn't matter, you know, people and people, it's, it's a, it's a store. It's another store of value. Like, like people like they see this digital um, football card or digital tweet that somebody can copy paste off of any computer and be like, I can use that too. But like, yeah, but yours was free and therefore you can't sell it. You know, this one actually, I, it's got a list of prices that goes along with it. They know how much it had been, has been paid for it in the past, all of those sort of things. That's, that's the, the appeal to NFTs is you can you can be like a collector of them and you can say but look at my fancy NFT collection you know it's like the new wave because when as things are transitioning into digital um you know property intellectual property even um yeah. what you want it to persist you know you want to be able to move and still have your collection with you you want your house to be 
able, I don't want to say you want your house to be able to burn down. Nobody wants that. But the fact is <laughs> you want, you want to know that your, 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 uh, you know, what you purchase is safe no matter what. And, and, the, and the most valuable asset anymore, I'm quoting a smarter person than me that said that it's no longer gold, it's computing, you know? Um, and, and it's, it's, it's the thing that's persisted. Um, it's digital, uh, value that's being stored in stocks. Whenever you trade stocks, you're just, you're just playing with digital value. Right. I'm mm -hmm. not going anywhere and signing any, any paperwork or whatever, when I trade stocks anymore, like I'm just trusting in this application, it's going to handle my money properly and give me my money back when it's time. And most of the time we don't even use cash money anymore. Yeah. You know? And, you know, I know people like Robin got a lot of flack and et cetera, but I do, value sure. robin I like, how, I like how you just and etc <laughs> like, that's a whole other 10 20 minute conversation yeah, because you, you were talking about like yeah. a digital platform and yeah. i think robin hood kind of gets into that space where like it's a digital platform but it also made it accessible accessible to like the common man you know like normally yeah. you have to buy stocks you have to like sign up with some stockbroker and pay this fee and all this stuff that was the old way. platforming yeah. and you know computing has made things accessible to a lot of people who didn't have access to these things before absolutely and now we just need to get the language the financial gobbly gook down to normal people speak and and everybody would know how to trade stocks but yeah um robin hood caught a lot of flack but um they they really dropped the ball we'll say it was not i don't believe it was intentional um even though they are backed by some of the people that stood to benefit from that happening um you know i i i know that their shutting down their platform had to do more with um them not having the capital to cover all of the volume that they were getting for all the, the possible the possibility that these right. things were going to keep going at the rate they were going to go and they had to shut down or if they didn't shut down those certain stocks those meme stocks as they were popularly called Anyone that's watching this in the future, do some. You probably heard about GameStop in 2021 or 2020, because wow, who, how, how could that not be history? Um, but yeah, like, uh, but, but yeah, I, I do believe that it's. Um, they either needed to shut down um, trading or limit trading on those, or they were going to have to shut down every single person on their platforms accounts if they were, if the, you know, if they didn't they weren't compliant with SEC regulations, which means they have to have enough capital to cover every single, you know, bet, I'll call it. Def yeah. <laughs> but Wall Street bets, diamond rings. <laughs> I still have a little bit of game stock. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you got in on that, did you? Game stonk. Yeah, no, I, I, made, I did. I, I, I quadrupled up. I mean, I got in, got out really quick when it was, you know, it was a very small amount, but I can gladly say I was part of that history. Like I put some money in there. I got a few shares, whatever. I won't say how much, but um, yeah, it went up four times. Um, and I, I was, I've been watching Forex. I've been watching charts for a long time. So I started to see the reversal happen. I'm like, yeah, get me out of here right now. I don't <laughs> care how much farther it goes up. I learned, I knew about that. And there are people, man, that went from I don't want to bring it all up, but yeah, this poor, poor guys, they went up from like, you know, 20 K to like 5 million or something. And then, and then back down to like 15 K and they're still holding or whatever. And, I, and I, it's, 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 it's kind of sad, but people are like, man, he's crazy at 5 million. I would have got out. No, you wouldn't not. He had to be crazy to get to 5 million. Like he, there's no way you go that far and aren't still like, come on moon. We're going for it all the way to I'm a billionaire. Yeah. You know? yeah. Who knows when you quit? Like, it, you know, your eyes light up and you start, start counting all your money that you don't have yet. And yeah. It's tough. Trading is it's, it's easy to say from the outside, how you would act, but it's uh, an emotional thing. It really is. It's a psychologically yeah. driven yeah. thing. And, no, and so your real money is involved. It's hard to explain how that is. But greed and fear are the two worst enemies of a trader. We'll talk about trading sometime soon. Um, we're going to oh, yeah, go ahead and cut this. We'll yeah. 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 Well, yeah, that's another, uh, that's another uh, future tune in. Stay tuned. We are not giving any trading advice. <laughs> yeah. As the disclaimer has gone, insert disclaimer here. None of this is financial uh, advice. Uh, hmm. Do not invest all your money in Tesla because that's <laughs> a really good idea. But anyway. <laughs> that's, did you know that that's how Lambda started? Oh, yeah. Had you heard that story? Yeah. No. Austin, the um, CEO of Lambda, 
Um, he was, yeah, he was out. He had moved to um, Silicon Valley and was looking for the job and couldn't, you know, put his right. entire net worth. I mean, maybe he worked a couple places or something, but he was living in his car or something, put his entire net worth into, into Tesla stock. It made made a really wise move apparently because like when he cat and then he cashed out a couple years later and started Lambda School. Wow. So yeah, good job, Elon. <laughs> Keep it going. Like I. No, whenever I, you come across that next Tesla stock, please like send that information my way. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if there will be. I mean, there, there's definitely. There always is that. Like, <laughs> there always is. There's always the some gold. Down, yeah, there's some gold down the line, and I mean that's. I almost would argue that Tesla is the next Tesla stock. Like the, the people, um, the ARK investors, Kathy Wood just put out something. Now that I'm involved, I know a lot. I, I, I won't say I know a lot, but I, I, I my foot's in the door, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm listening a lot to all the all the financial news. But um, yeah, I, I'm surprised I pulled those names out, but, but ARK investing, Kathy Woods, Kathy Woods <laughs> has, had they, they put out their forecast for Tesla in 2025 and say that the stock should be at a low value of 1500 high value in the 2200 range or something along those lines so right now it's only about 600 so you know if you have a few years and and to leave some money somewhere rather than a savings account that's might not be a bad place to start i'm not saying today because you know so first of all today is not even today anymore because this is this was recorded yesterday for anybody watching it live um and if you're watching it in the future you know do your own research. <laughs> so, yeah, word for it. no, please don't. <laughs> I will say, let's end it there. This is uh, Timothy Aiken. This is Sadani Daly. And this has been another episode of Spill the Data. Spill the Data. Bye bye.